the power of dominion, God's intention for it. Get ready to be blessed. A much forgotten topic, a much misunderstood topic, a much neglected topic is dominion. And I'm so thrilled that God honored me to call our ministry by that name. And uh, soon we'll be launching several projects. Let me not announce it ahead of time, but uh, I'm just telling you. Last night, the Lord really had me smash many demons. I don't know if you watched the broadcast from last night, but my God, I was on fire. What was that called? Replacing... Uh, waiting with acceleration. So powerful. The Lord said to me, what are you waiting for? He said it to others. Who told you you're in a season of waiting? You know? <laughs> All this stuff in the church about... Um, Waiting, wilderness, suffering, cancel all of that. Write that down. I must cancel that. Wilderness, suffering, waiting, affliction, you know, God's timing, error, 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 E R R O R. God's timing. Let me tell you about God's timing. The reason why Jesus didn't come yet is because the world has not been evangelized. The reason Jesus has not come yet is because there's still so many people to be saved and the church has been asleep. A dear prophet friend of mine just wrote a message about something governmental going on, which I'm actually just uh, stumbled on in the last five minutes. I'm really shocked and appalled, but I'm not going to think about it. You know, about things that are people creeping in. The scripture says in Matthew, uh, well, where is it now? Matthew 13, 25. While they slept, the enemy came in and sowed tares among the, the wheat and then went his way. Remember when Jesus said, uh, he told the disciples to rise up and pray and they, they couldn't stay up, they couldn't even do an hour. And then Isaiah 52 says, Wake, O Zion, thou that slumbers and sleeps. Wake up. Psalm 68 says, let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. Let God arise. I, I want to say, are you kidding me? As if he's not already a a arisen. <laughs> You're going to tell God he's asleep. No, Psalm 121 says he never sleeps or slumbers. My God, I feel the anointing here. Oh, my God. So his timing is something that he's, he's already told us what he wants to do. I'm going to prove it to you. See, this is what we need is teaching from the Bible, not from opinions, not from culture clubs, not from different tents in the big camp of the church that people believe this way and go that way. Sometimes the enemy has come in and sowed wrong messages or wrong philosophies or wrong emphasis. Like it says in Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, don't be carried, a, a, a 13 or 14, don't be carried away by winds of doctrine like children, swayed here and there. You need to know the central theme of the word. Jesus said, go, the Great Commission, he gave it to all of us back then, and he never changed his mind. You want to talk about being healed or healing? He said, I want you to be healed, and that's it. I will. That means he wills forever. And uh, he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature and make disciples of all nations. Is there a timing for that or was it, or, or was it set in motion from then? Which one? It was set in motion from then. You get that? He didn't, he didn't decide one day to wake up and go, oh, you know, uh, I have a timing for this for you. Do you, do you see how ludicrous that is? And people use Isaiah 60, 22 wrongly. They said, well, in God's time, everything good will happen. No, he didn't say that. The scripture said, when you are ready, I was already ready, if I can paraphrase it. 
I, the Lord, will hasten it in its time. He didn't say my time or your time. Guess what that means? I'll tell you by revelation. I've had revelation on this for many years. It means when it's ready, when you're ready for it. Say amen. amen. God's already ready. He's not waiting for some mysterious moment in the month of March, whatever date it is. He doesn't think like that. You know, the first of the month, it's funny in the church, everybody goes, this new month, I got to declare something. In April, you say it's April Fool's Day, so you try to do a joke. <laughs> I tell you, wait till next April, someone remind me, I'll do an April 1st because it's April Fool's Day, right? I'll do a joke instead of a real message. I'll do something real sarcastic and everybody will go, oh, the prophet, what you say? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm going to pull up my goats laughing at people. I have a video clip of goats. I put it on last night. It's so hysterical. This new month, you know, blah, blah, blah. Let me tell you something. God is like that on the 17th, the 25th, the 31st, the 30th, the 28th day of February, the 29th day of February, every four years, leap year. The 7th, the 10th, the 15th. You think God cares about the Gregorian calendar? He doesn't care. He's ready to do what he wants to do now. A great evangelist said, God goes with the goers. He doesn't sit with the sitters. If you're going to sit down too much and waste time, you're being deceived. We all have to repent, even me, your illustrious prophet. We have to repent. Let's repent. I'm not scared to say that. I, I don't. I don't have any problem saying, I, I'll, tell you, I'll tell it straight. We need to repent of wasting any time, losing any time, because the clock is ticking. So Jesus has an appointed time, and God made it so mysterious that he doesn't even know the day or the hour. Yeah, because the Father's going to call the shots on that one. But the Scripture says he's the husbandman who waits a long time with great patience for the harvest. What he wants is the harvest. When the harvest is done, he's coming. And guess what? I'm going up. In the, in the first load, in the rapture, the first, uh, the first uh, elevator expressway up. I don't know how he's going to do it, but I'm going. If you don't like it, you can stay here and fight with the Antichrist, and they'll kill you. They'll torture and abuse you and make you take the mark of the beast, and if you take the mark of the beast, you lose your salvation. Do you know there will be believers who will be so afraid and terrified, I hate to say this, and I, hope it, I pray it couldn't happen, but if people don't, Let's say some didn't go up in the rapture. This is, very, this is a very mystical topic. It's a very, it's a bit scary, you know. If you didn't go up and you had to stay around and dance, and the scripture says to buy or sell, you have to take the mark of the beast. Once you take it, the scripture says you lose your salvation because you're taking the mark of 666. Eh? You're leaving the 777, if we could call it in that, the perfection, the seven spirits of God, Isaiah 11:2. Uh, Revelation 5, 12, and also in another place in Revelation talks about the seven spirits of God. The Holy Spirit gave his own attributes in Isaiah 11, verse 2. You could read it later. I teach on that a lot if you've been following me. And in Revelation 5, 12, I teach on that a lot if you've been following me. I don't want to do that right now. But uh, Revelation 5, 12 talks about he received power and riches and wisdom and strength and blessing, glory, and honor. For what? The purpose of us having dominion. So that fits in right here, right now. The attributes of God, power and riches and wealth. How many people do you know have those three? How many people around are walking in those three? I got, they got so much power. They got so much wealth and riches. They have so much wisdom. You just don't know what to do with them. It's too rare. And most preachers don't have hardly any of it either. And they're trying to convince everybody that they're you know, valid. Here's, here's a wisdom key. I'm going to go in and out of like some success principles as well as kingdom things and spiritual things all together. Uh, never listen to anybody that uh, is a sad soul. They have a bad testimony. <laughs> they don't have any success in their life. They don't know much. They can't advise you. So I call this, I want, to call, I want to subtitle that little point, stay away from, be, uh, be, oh, no, not stay away from, because some of them you have to interact with them because they're your, they have a purpose, you know. Be careful about the juniors. <laughs> juniors are the wannabes 
that are trying to climb the ladder and they'll be glad to rip your clothes on the way up and step on your head on the way when they take the next leap up. They'll be glad to do it. Yeah? But mature senior people are not like that. You find an old apostle or an old prophet or an old, you know, some, not, I don't mean old, I hate the word old, but, you know, mature. They're not like that. They're so successful and they're so powerful in their own right and they have a father's heart. They're a mentor, not a menace. <laughs> you know, write that down. We need mentors, not menaces. We need a mentor, not a menace. Then it's the menace. Remember that cartoon? It ruined everything. And it's sometimes a painful experience when you look to people and you think, hey, you know, I, I, I uh, want to rely on somebody, but they're not, you find out they're not reliable. That can sting you for a minute. You've got to get past that. So you want to get in the place where you're connected with God. Yesterday I was sharing a point of a real, it's a real dominion key. Somebody from the world got a revelation that God loves them. And they were saying, God is for me, but if you're not, that's okay. I have to do more with him. That's basically the, the, the derivative of what he was saying. And he was saying it with such passion. So I, got, I felt stirred up by that. I was like, wow, bro, that's powerful. So God is rooting for me, and he's waiting for me. Watch this now. He's wa I'm not waiting for him. He's waiting for me. Yeah, he needs to do some things for us, of course. But the more we move, the more he moves. Huh? To the pure, write that down. The more we move, the more he moves. Smith Wigglesworth used to say, if I don't feel the spirit moving, I move the spirit. If I don't see God initiating anything, I go to him and we initiate it together. So this is the purpose of dominion. The power of dominion is to take over. Take over what? Everything. Why? Because we're kings and priests unto him. Why? Because he said, shout for the Lord's given you the city. Joshua 6.16, write that down. Joshua 6.16, shout for the Lord has given us the city. I just love that. Every time I see it in my phone, I screenshot it. The time, 6.16 a.m. or 6.16 p.m. I do the 8.18. Whenever I see it's 8.18 a.m. or 8.18 p.m., I'm reminded of Deuteronomy 8.18, I'm the Lord your God who gives you power to get wealth. I love 3.13 also, Galatians 3.13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. So what? So that the blessing of Abraham can come upon us. Anywhere in the scripture you see Abraham, it's a dominion thing. It's a wealth thing. Abraham was the money man. Abraham was the rich father. So anytime you see anything about Abraham, even, I, even Isaiah the prophet in Isaiah 51 verse 1 talked about Abraham. He, had a, he gave a mention of Abraham. He says, God has called you apart alone, dug you out of the rock. In other words, you're old, whatever what you were. And, and, and called you, separated you to be alone with him. And then he blessed him and then he increased him. It wouldn't be a complete verse without the word increase. Abraham was rich. At least 200 billion U.S. dollars in his treasury. At least. It's been estimated. Solomon was a trillion dollar man. Yeah, he was a trillionaire. Job was a billionaire. Jehoshaphat was a billionaire. Um, Paul was probably a multi-millionaire. I don't think he got to the billions because he was just so focused on the ministry. He couldn't do so much tent making, but maybe he was doing really well in his business. The scripture doesn't really tell us. Historically, it's estimated that Abraham was worth as much as 200 billion U.S. dollars or more based on what the scripture said he had. Job, the camels, he had 6,000 camels from 3,000. And a prized camel would go for as much as $2.7 million. In Saudi Arabia, there was an auction, and the real uh, fancy super breed uh, camels sold for $2.7 million in the auction. And 1.3 was maybe the lower amount. Let's take the lower amount and just do six dollars. Let's just say you're even off with a, few, a couple of zeros. You still, it's too, still too much money to argue with. This is just Job's camels. Camels were valuable back then because they were the commodity of transportation of the day. So I want to I get this over to you, that everybody in Scripture, 
uh, our patriarchs were all wealthy financially. Someone lift your hand and say, that's me too. That's me. Now, now, if you don't focus on that, if you don't at least say it and think about it, get the revelation of it, how are you going to get it? Think, people think things come by chance. Well, one day I'm going to be, one day I'm going to have, and you don't do anything to develop it. You don't do any, if you don't do anything to develop it, you're not going to have it. You got to work it. And then when things begin to happen, you say, well, I worked on this. This was something that I, that I worked on and focused on and did. And now when it, when it manifests, hey, you know, great. So 1.3 million on the lower side, yeah? Times 6,000, you know how much that is? $1.3 million times 6,000. Can I do the math for you? It's 9.9 .9 billion, with a B, U.S. dollars. Just his dusty camel. Let's say somebody miscalculated that and you got a serious discount in the hundreds of thousands, and maybe not the millions. You're still going to be over a billion. Even if you go nine times down in the price, it's still going to be like more than $1 billion of camel. And God doesn't think about us being rich. Are you kidding me? You haven't read the scripture. What about Psalm 35, 27? We should, have the, we should have his praise going on with us, and he needs to be magnified. And then he said, I take pleasure in the prosperity of my servant. Okay, you might say, well, that's, that's a psalm in the old days. David, the warrior, the wild man, the man collecting gold. I, I taught on this a few Sundays ago about um, 1 Kings 9, like 15th verse, somewhere in there, 15, 16, talked about how Hiram was Solomon's manager. He was his underboss, so to speak. And he, Hi, Solomon didn't go, and Hiram didn't even go. Hiram sent the seamen who knew how to navigate the sea with the ships, and Solomon's own servants went on the ships, and they collected 420 talents of gold. Now, let me tell you, the, the servants of Solomon, the loyal ones, knew the boss's mind. They followed the instruction, not Solomon directly. Hiram, his manager, spoke it. That tells you the entourage that Solomon had. I begin to dive into that. Did Solomon live a dominion life? Oh, my. Did David live a dominion lifestyle? Oh, my God. Yes, he did. And let me tell you, none of that gold went missing because Solomon's servants were there. 420 talents they got, which is a lot. It's millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars. I don't know. If we did the math on that, I have to figure out how much is one talent of gold times 420. Maybe someone can look that up for me. Some, not, not right now, but let's get the number later because I don't know if it's millions or billions. But it's definitely many, many millions. Probably hundreds of millions of U.S. dollars worth of gold, I would imagine. So, or going toward that anyway. That's what they were doing. And I thought, when I read that, I get convicted. I thought, what am I doing? What am I doing? What kind of life do I have compared to that? Lift your hands and say, Lord, I repent. The only thing you can do is repent. Don't go, oh, yeah, you know. Let me see one person try to argue with this, this stuff with me, and I'll, I'll smile at you and say, I love you. Okay, praise the Lord. But I might pray to get rid of it, get that person out of here. You know who I want in this ministry is the people that belong here. Lift your hands, say amen. People that believe and want to connect and want to, want to partake of what, what, we're, what we're doing here. If we had enough thousands of people like flowing like this with the revelation that God's given to me, uh, we're going we're gonna to really get somewhere. And God wants to bless you. Say amen. amen. Whatever level you're at is like nowhere. It's really nowhere, I guess I have to tell you, in love as a father. It's nowhere compared to where God wants to take you. And the Lord had to come and kick me in the blessed assurance. I don't think he physically did it. I didn't, I didn't feel any pain, but I mean, I just wanted to, maybe in the spirit, you know. Say, look, son, what are you, come on now, you know. And stirred me up last night about this thing of waiting. And I had a friend in America to confirm it, you know. A powerful, powerful, powerful man of God to confirm this. You know, some people are so good 
I, I, I'm, I'm going to make a joke. I probably shouldn't say this. I wish I could have an earpiece playing and listening like on a sound delay, and then he says, and then I repeat exactly what he says, because his message was so good. I would even quote him. I thought about that. I said, could I, could I get away with doing that? Lord, would you let me do that? No, I'm joking. I'm joking. I have him speaking in my head, and I'm just repeating what he was saying, because he brought this message out about that thing so clearly. You know, you have people in the church that, have you ever heard, I know you've heard it, suffering is God's will. Even if you get sick, you don't have enough power to cast it out. Yeah? What's wrong with us? Demons and sickness and poverty are arch enemies of the believer. Lift your hands, say, I cast every one of them out in Jesus' name and say, Lord, I repent for ever tolerating any of that in my world, for even for a minute. You don't go, well, the devil did this, and you know. If you do that, you placate him, you're sticking up for him. Let me tell you something never to say to me. People are different. You like to say that around here, right? Don't ever say that to me. Because what you're also saying is you're agreeing with the wrong part of culture and maybe sticking up for them, the evildoer. Well, you know, people are different. Like, you explain it in a way like that's just how it is. No, you're supposed to cancel it. Or T-I-K, you know what that means? Or TIA, you know what that means? This is Africa. <laughs> this is Kenya. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't even want to. I don't even want to release a curse to say it's your Kenya because it shouldn't be. You need to repent. So you see, no one teaches about uh, us about repentance except these these rallies where they have people are praying, but they're repenting about the wrong things. I've observed that over the years. People are repenting about the wrong things. They, they think they, you're supposed to repent on someone else's behalf. No, you're supposed to repent about yourself. I don't care what some idiot did along the way. I wasn't there. I had nothing to do with it. It is not in my account. It's not in my family line, especially, look at me, it's not in my family line. We're brothers from different mothers for sure. Hmm? I didn't just turn out light because I didn't go out in the sun. I got it from my DNA. From my mama who was white and my father who was white. Europeans. By America. But I'm not just American. I got, I'm something better than American. I'm a, I'm a global citizen in the 21st century church. Can you say Amen. In the 21st century, in my generation, I'm a global citizen. I have dominion across all the nations of the world. That's really me and the spirit. So I have to keep pushing myself to stay up on that level. And you need to do that too. So to repent, oh, we repent, Lord, for the sins of the nation. Well, that is error. Okay? If someone gets a revelation to do that, fine. Maybe it'll do something and God's just going like this. You know, can, can I tell you what I, what I feel? God's just looking like this. You adept, inept thinking person. Will you just get up and do something yourself without the help of anybody else with my hand, with my help? Put your hand in my hand and get busy. I saw a guy from the world which should shame the whole church. I don't know about that guy if I'll ever meet him. Probably I'll find him. I wish I'd have the privilege to pray with him and lead him to the Lord. And say, now you... Clean up your act, uh, your, your, the way you talk, you know, your rap genre, all the words you use that you can't say in church. Get rid of that and just speak and share the passion of the heart that people have the identity of success in them, stamped in them from our maker. I'm going to add, I mean, he didn't say this, I'm saying this. this is, I'm just quoting something he said that I like. He said, God is for me, it doesn't matter if you're not for me. And he said, oh, you, you know, and he used some choice language. And you people, like whatever, you know, because you know, people are competitive. They hate, they hate each other. They, they're jealous of each other. Come on now. They're jealous of your success. They want to fight. They want to destroy. You can't let that happen. You're supposed to put your hand and keep your hand in the hand of God. The minute you let go, oh, now you went to sleep. You backslid. <laughs> Whether you, whatever you were not doing or not doing, it's not the point. In your heart, in your mind, you slid back. You took a back seat. You sat down. God doesn't sit with the sitters. 
He goes with the goers. He does through the doers. And I said this yesterday, I want to say it again. This is a dominion principle. If you don't do anything, what have you done? Nothing. And if you don't do anything, <laughs> how are you going to hear, well done? Because you didn't, you didn't did. You, did. you didn't did anything. You didn't do anything. Hello? And God, the, Jesus is just going to tell me because I, I confessed him as my Savior and lived a lazy life and didn't do anything. You know, didn't persevere, didn't push through, didn't get persecuted for his name, didn't fight any battles. And he's just going to tell you, well done. Well done for what? God doesn't lie. I'll prove it to you. Numbers 23, 19, write that down. God is not a man that he should lie, or the son of man that he should repent. Has he spoken it? Will it not come to pass? Yes, it will. Uh, Jeremiah 9 somewhere. I can't remember the exact verse. Jeremiah 9 something says, He's not my word like a hammer that crushes the rock into pieces. Jesus even said, It's better that you fall on the rock and be broken than you could be, you know, bend it back together and get up and walk and you got some new revelation. Then the rock falls on you and you be crushed to powder. So if you sit around waiting, the enemy will come in to destroy. And how... This is very difficult. To, 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 it's a painful uh, process to get this revelation. The more you allow him to do, you have to undo all that. Funny analogy. I saw people that, you know, they let their... I, I, I don't want to be getting into something if someone's like got a, that issue. I don't want them to feel bad. Uh, you know, I don't. But let's say they let themselves go, so to speak, physically, you know, to the point of expansion, <laughs> expanding the enterprise. Uh, and then you've got to fix that. Now, what if you go and say you want to lose weight? It's hell on earth. The, you have to starve yourself, nearly kill yourself. And then all the fat pockets are there and then the wrinkles, you know? You know the, where the body was expanded and then when you shrink the weight, now you've got like... Uh, you know those puppies, those Malibu dogs that are all wrinkles? You ever see Mr. Bigglesworth, the cat, the, the naked cat that doesn't have any hair? He's all wrinkles. In the movie, Mr. Bigglesworth. I don't know what they call those cats, but the Malibu dogs, you know? They're bald and they're all wrinkles, you know? You got all those things. What do you get? Maybe if you get rich, you could go to the body sculpting people. If you need help, uh, ask me. I'll tell you where to go. So I'm working on that myself. And I got one last, I got last, one last mountain to conquer, one last horizon to fix is around here. And I'm gonna, it's gonna be gone. And I found people that can do it. But guess what? You gotta go. You gotta pay a lot of money. You gotta go there every day. You gotta let them work on you. It's rough. Yeah? Somebody paid for me for sessions and then they got tired of doing it and they gave me their sessions. So I inherited 16 sessions, so I got like seven left. I did so many. These things where it can burn the fat in the body. There's a lot of processes you can do in that stuff. So uh, as I do it more, you can talk to me. I'll help you. There's no reason why someone should be really out of shape and whatever. You need to work on yourself. And every doctor keeps saying you need to do some exercise. So don't try to be an athlete again, because they know, they know I was a bodybuilder years ago. Don't try that again. You know, and I had some titanium plates put in my arm. You can almost hear it. It's scary. You hear that? That don't sound like bone, does it? <laughs> Guess what? It's solid steel inside you. There's something that happened. And they said I could never use my arm again. I said, really? Watch me. There it is. Uh, the best neurosurgeon in Europe fixed it for me for free. And the plates cost 10,000 British pounds each. Plus all the other work. So I got like uh, 100,000 pounds in me. I'm like the bionic man, like the Terminator. Remember when the flesh peeled off of him and you see the, the skeletal was made out of steel? The cyborg, I'm part cyborg now, I guess. So I don't know about lifting those, you know, I used to bench press 350 pounds. I'm not going to try that again now, because if I had that thing in the air and this arm wanted to, it's like, yeah. 
But you could do the light weights, you know, the baby weights, you know? You get the little dumbbells and you, you, know, you work your biceps, your triceps, your quads, your, your quadriceps, your, your, your uh, what do you call those? Lats, they call them the lats, I can't remember the whole name. The, the muscles in the back, the obliques around here, the abdominal muscles. You gotta do exercise for that. And if you don't exercise your whole life, you're gonna have a problem. At least walk briskly, do something anyway. How did I get into that? I did that yesterday too. The Lord had me like for 20 minutes at the beginning of the message. Last night's message went two hours on the dot. I was shocked. Two hours. I was so caught up in the glory talking about that. Replace waiting with acceleration. Is that powerful? In other words, don't wait for anything. So all this thing we have in our, in our own grasp to do, and if we don't do it, are we really living the dominion life? The power of dominion and God's intention for it is that we do something. And he spoke about what he provided there in Genesis 1.26. I made man in my own image. Genesis 1.26, God said, I've made man in my own image after my own likeness. And I want them to have dominion over everything on the earth the fowl of the air, the fish of the sea, and everything that creeps upon the earth, and even all the creeps that walk around the city that you're in. Luke 10, 19, I tread upon serpents and scorpions and crush them under my feet, and nothing shall by any means hurt me. Say amen. amen. Jesus, the, the, the ideal scripture about walking in the anointing is Acts 10, 38. Real dominion here. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. If God's with you, you could do the miraculous. Wanna, I want to see that. And, and I want to challenge people too. Don't be afraid to pray for somebody. If someone say, well, what if they don't get healed? Well, what if they do? Are you embarrassed for yourself? I heard some guy talking about suicide. Why do people commit? I, I didn't like the answer. I, didn't, I don't totally agree, but it's half of it maybe. But it's not the whole thing. Well, someone who commits suicide, they're very self-centered. I thought, no, they, they got locked up and they can't see the ahead. They're, they're depressed because they're stuck somehow. Something's wrong with their head. They don't see the way forward. Not that just that they're so self-centered. Well, it's basically saying, like, get a purpose where you're taking care of people so much and then, you know, you won't. No, you can still get depressed anyway. If you don't see enough way ahead for yourself. 1 Corinthians, I'm sharing a lot of scriptures here. I'm going fast, but you, you're catching. I believe in the word. The word is what produces life and gets us free, not man's opinion. Or oh, the hot air of your bellowing because you, have, you think you got the mic and you're going to speak now. Share, share the depth of the word. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three onward to about the 32nd verse or so is the story of the Lord's table. We take communion every Sunday. We're going to take it here in a few moments. Uh... Upon finishing the message, we'll do a quick uh, uh, time of communion. Yep, it's ready here. There's the table. And what that does is it, we're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus and partaking of his life. When you do that, you honor him and you're saying, Lord, come into me, your resurrection power, because he gave it all and fixed it all. Now, we want to receive more of him. But in there it says, many don't discern the body, which could also be your own calling. And this thing about God is for me, I have to push myself. God is for me, I don't have an excuse. Like the man at the Pool of Bethesda in John chapter 5. I was there, the five portraits of Solomon at the Pool of Bethesda in Jerusalem. I was there. What a place. You see the actual five uh, columns, you know, these porches with the columns up and the little pool there, it's still there. I thought, this is amazing. This is where the angel literally showed up and troubled the water. I stood right there. You could touch the water in the pool of Bethesda. But he made the excuse. So you don't have that excuse. Jesus showed up and stood next to him and said, now what's your excuse? You're going to wait more? And, and the Lord had mercy on him and said, okay, take up your bed. Take up your bed and walk. And he healed him right there. He didn't wait for him to feel like, I got the faith, I got the revelation. I, he just was laying there complaining and moaning. Jesus said, pow. Pew. Now you're strong, you know, I've healed you. Get up and walk. 
Many don't discern the body. And, and for this cause, many are weak and many sleep. Weak means you slide back, you backslide. I'm not, do people think backslide, you say you backslide means you commit some sin or, no, it just means you stop, you, you, you got off the wall, you got off your, your, your position. You know, you slid back somehow. And then, uh, you went to sleep when you were supposed to be awake, operating. Here's, here's something powerful. They were healed as they went. Remember Jesus told some to go to the pool of Siloam or whatever and uh, wash there and go see the priest or whatever. Kind of a strange instruction. We can't relate to it because that was in their setting in the other day. We don't know what it means. I don't know what that means. Go see the priest. Which priest? Pool of Siloam? Where's that? Do what? Okay, Lord, whatever you say, you're the boss. The prophet Elisha told Naaman to dip in the muddy river Jordan seven times. He didn't want to do it, but that was the instruction. And the seventh time he got healed. And then the leprosy that came off of him went on to uh, uh, Naaman, I mean, uh, Gehazi, because he was doing tricky things. That's bad. Miriam annoyed God when she complained against Moses, and God struck her with leprosy. And Moses went and prayed, and then God listened to Moses' prayer and took it off of her in the, in, after seven days. But she would have stayed with that. Who was the one that went in and touched the showbread on the table or whatever, wasn't supposed to touch it, one king, and uh, he got smitten with leprosy and died. God is serious about his things. This is why, that's why I'm saying all that. We have to take very seriously the call of God. I feel more than ever the seriousness of it. I, I always have, but you know, sometimes you... You slip and slide. You know what I mean? Again, I'm not talking about a uh, uh, fleshly thing. I'm talking about in your mind, in your arena, in your persona. Something got wounded somewhere. Something kicked you off the zeal of the Lord of hosts that consumed us. Like the disciples said, the, the zeal of the Lord of hosts has consumed us. So he said many, in 1 Corinthians 11, from the 23rd verse onward, Many don't discern the body, the body of Christ, meaning, our, okay, I, I want to apply that to us, the calling that we have individually. We have to go after it with all our heart, yes or yes? And all our might, soul, and strength. Then we're doing God's service. If not, what are we doing? Nothing. If you're not doing anything, what are you doing? Nothing. What do you expect to be rewarded for? You got no reference point. You got a track record. You don't have to go to God and say, Lord, I did this and I did this. He knows all about that. Stay humble. Don't act like I'm great because I did this. Just God, no, God, you know. You know where I'm at. But the more you're doing, the more God can do for you. Write that down. The more I'm doing, the more God can do for me. So get busy about it. In the, in the success system principles of... Uh, that people would even say, teach you from the, in the secular society, they'd say 80% uh, of success is just showing up. It's true. You just got to show up. Whether you feel like it or not. A great bishop who has a man, an apostle, who has like tens of thousands of churches and he's got the largest church in the world over in Nigeria. And he just built, he had 60,000 seats. He had 50, then he went to 60. Expanded it. Now he just built another arena. I think he's building it now. He's going to sit 110,000 people. And uh, he, he has a statement. He says, I don't stop when I'm tired. I stop when I'm done. You know, he's, he's a wild guy. He might give an appointment to a preacher to see him at 2 o'clock in the morning because he's busy the rest of the day. And he doesn't care at all. There's one buddy, somebody gave an appointment, they gave an appointment to, one of his assistants said the time, and they thought maybe he was kidding, or it was too late, or he fell asleep, and they didn't make it. So he missed it. And then here's what he said, here's what he said apostolically over a man of God uh, that I know, a friend from America, and 
his relative that's also a preacher, they went to a meeting he was in and got to see him and he, uh, the bishop called for them to pray over them. And uh, the one that I know said, uh, I got by his right hand, he said, now kneel down here. I'm going to pray for you and lay hands on you. And he's a short man. The man of God is a very short guy. He's not a big, tall, booming guy. He's a smaller stature in the natural, but very powerful in the spirit. So the one guy I know, he says, uh, I got near his right hand. He said, why? Because I know the Bible. The right hand's where the blessing is. You know Jacob and Esau, right? The right hand. So he, he had his right hand on his head, and this is what the man of God said to him. He said, everything you've done till now is one thing, but what's coming is beyond astounding. You, you're going to be astounded. And it's come to pass because his ministry has skyrocketed. He's blown up. And he said, and he yelled at him, now go and do what I taught here today. <laughs> nice prayer, yeah? Okay, I'm done, go. Black Nigerian man, he, these guys are white. He said, send me the two white angels. Bring me the two white angels over here. I want to pray for them. Kneel down. And my friend got by his right hand. That's what he said to him. So what you've seen so far is one thing. But what's coming, what God's going to use you to achieve is astounding. And then he shouted at him, now go and do the things I've taught here today. Did he say in the name of Jesus? Maybe in the name of Jesus. Maybe he didn't. Get up and go. And the power of God was transmuted him through that little wild declaration, and it's come to pass. So dominion is a lifestyle of, of power and authority. Right? And everything in the world would try to challenge that. Everybody would try to challenge that and keep you like away from it. The devil especially. Here's a real powerful uh, principle here. Wherever you feel less than your royal self, leave. Some people don't like you. Some people overlook you. Different categories. Some people reject you. Some people hate you because of who you are. The devil hates you. His ugly friends will too. And some people don't care also. Well, that's another category of people, the evil doers. But some people just, you know, there's something wrong with them. Here's the thing, you never want to self-reflect someone's negative attitude and, and cast it upon yourself like a spell. Don't ever do that. Don't cast a spell upon yourself. That's deep. Write that down. That sounds real. That, that really works. In America, I don't know how that works, but in Africa, that really will work. Yeah? That'll really fly in Africa. All you Africans with all the witchy, witchy was. Witchy, witchy hoodoo. And the jingas that black sorcerers, you know, juju men, whatever you call them, I don't know. Don't cast a spell upon yourself. Ha! Don't, ha! Don't reflect other people's foolishness. And then there's a culture like, oh, don't make waves, don't make noise. Why not? Why not? You only live once. It's only James Bond, you only live twice. Remember that movie? Beautiful song. You only live twice. Da, 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 da. I love that music. Little Japanese. That was the one that had the Japanese people in it. They call it a hey, Bonson. And everybody, Japanese, they called. They add a son after your word. They called. They would call me Tomson. Tomson. Hey, Tom, Thomas Son. Mr. Bond Son, James Bond Son. You only live twice. No, you only live once, and then the judgment. And the clock is ticking, have you noticed? Jesus said what? Redeem the time, for the days are evil. What else did he say? Work while it's day, because night is coming when no man can work. When God switches the lights off, the time for dispensation change happens. We, there's nothing else you can do. So I made this statement, I think I said it yesterday. Yeah, I want to say it again. If I, say, if I said it yesterday, I'll repeat it. I don't want to have the rapture come instead of me saying a totally 
hallelujah from my toes to my tops of my hair. Praise God. Uh, and everywhere else, I'm going to hallelujah. I'm happy instead of saying like, oh no, I still had something more undone. Because I feel like that. I'll tell you something deep that happened to me some months ago. I had a vision, I had a, a dream. And I woke up and it was a vision. Sometimes you have a prophetic dream and it's a, you know it's prophetic because you, you wake up and the anointing is there. The presence of God is there. And you're still seeing it. You're still in it. You don't like, doesn't, it doesn't end. You know, it continues over after you've woken up. That's how you know it's a prophetic dream. It's really a vision. But you started seeing it in your sleep. Solomon had that happen after he burnt a, th burnt a thousand offerings to the Lord. He was so tired from that festival. That whole thing that he did was so strenuous, he fell unconscious in the deep sleep. And God didn't wait till he woke up to come and bless him. He says, you've done this for me. What do you want me to do for you? God came to him while he was asleep and gave him a vision and told him how he was going to bless him. Lift your hands. Can God do that for you? If you've done a lot, depends if you've done nothing, then forget about it. So I, had, I saw myself walking into heaven in this vision. And I thought right away, this has to be a, a prophetic, symbol, symbolic thing somehow because it's not really going to happen yet. I'm not going there. If I go, it's just a visit. I'm coming right back. Because <laughs> my <coughs> assignment is here and I'm not nearly done. Not even close. So I'm not going for a long time. <clears throat> if the Lord decides to come in my lifetime, I hope so, then uh, let's go. But I'm not done. So I saw myself walking toward the gate. I saw the big gate. You know, it talks about the gate of pearl in Revelation. Tremendous. It, was, it had light on it that I can't explain. There was a feeling in the air like I can't explain, the glory, of, the glory of heaven, the glory of God. It was so amazing, and it was very sumptuous uh, in, in the spirit, not naturally, but just you want to go there, you want to be there, you want to experience it. And I'm walking toward it, and something rose up in me uh, like against the whole thing, and I said, no, I'm not done. I'm not satisfied. So people look shocked. Some other people were there, I don't know who they were, some angels, they looked at me with a puzzled look, but I, I stopped and I turned around and I started walking back. I said, I want to go back. I'm not ready to come. Because I, like I, I felt like if I crossed through the gate, uh, I'd be there. I kind of had that feeling. Don't, don't know if that's the case or not, but I, that's how I felt. And I turned around and started walking back, and everybody looked at me like, what are you, where are you going? I thought, I said, I'm not done. I have to go back. I have to bring more here. I have to bring more here. I can't come with the, with the people I've touched yet. I can't handle that. For eternity. It's like, I felt like the symbolism, it, it wasn't going to really happen, but the symbolism of it was, once I crossed past the gate and into the city, but I guess it's the heavenly Jerusalem, whatever, the new Jerusalem, I, I wouldn't come back. Maybe. I had that feeling. I was wondering about that. I said, no, I'm going back. I got to go do more. Lift your hands right now. Dominion is to take over, and I want to break and cancel everything that stops you. I don't care if it's your family. I don't care if it's a church. If it's a church, it gives you the wrong vibe. Get out of there! Kick the dust and don't tell them you're leaving. Just go. If you feel I have to go talk to the pastor and tell him, well, do what you want to do. Do how your heart tells you. But leave. Just go. Or just disappear. And have some prayer time. And fellowship with me. Connect with me. Dive into the messages. Get, the, get this anointing and the realms of the teaching that I'm bringing. Get it, let it get on you. You know how many people, you know how many multitudes of people need to be with me? I'm not saying that to be like, you know, rambunctious about it. God spoke to me. I don't, I don't know if I want to say the number right now. I don't think I'm going to say it. Tell me the number that we need to get in a, in a reasonably soon amount of time. And let me just give you a hint. It's not, it doesn't end with hundred. Hundred. 
Can I say 100? No, it's the T-H-O-U-S-A-N-D word. Yeah. And that's a small number compared to the people. Do you know I counted and estimated that my own meetings in one city, you know the city? So I like to keep this timeless and global. I don't like to, you, know, you notice I don't name a lot of, if I say a street name or a city or something, it's a really kind of unusual because I just, on purpose I don't do it because I want the people to get the revelation. You could be somewhere else and not relate to anything. I could, the local people in a place where I'm frequenting or am, you know, you'd understand, but I don't have to, I don't have to tell you. But I want to say this for the, in principle form for everybody. I don't want to just make it like it's a local. I'm not a local church. <laughs> don't look at me like that. I'm not a local church. I'm a global church. Let's lift our hands and pray in the Holy Ghost. I'm a global citizen in in the 21st century. That's the time we're alive in this generation. We have this generation to live in the 2100s, which was from 2000 onward is the 21st century. So I guess that will be from 2000 until 2100, right? 2000. Two zero, we're still in the two zero something. It's a bit hard to figure that out. And then let's say you go 50, 60, that's good. 70, I don't know, I don't think we'll go that long. That's a long time, eh? From the 20s, that's 50 years, yeah? From the 20s to the, 50, to the 70s, it's 50 years, yeah? Do I have 50 years left? Nope. <laughs> I don't got the revelation that I'll be walking to the pulpit when I'm 111. I like the number, but, or a hundred and what, or a hundred, I don't know what it would be. <laughs> Kenneth Hagin went to be with the Lord when he was in his mid-80s. Lester Sumrall went when he was in his mid-80s. Oral Roberts went when he was 91. Billy Graham lived phenomenally long to 99. He said he should have died by 90. At 90 years old, he was ready. He was shocked that he kept going in his 90s and he wouldn't die until 99, whatever. The last many years of the last decade of his life, he didn't do anything. What did he do? Sit around in North Carolina, you know, with the kids. And he actually said he had one regret in his ministry. He wished he had spent more time with his family earlier on instead of being gone all the time. Well, I don't know. A lot of the people that got saved in his crusades, they would argue with that. Say, hey, I was more important. I didn't know I was coming to that Billy Graham crusade, Mr. Billy Graham. You tell me your kids are important. Keep it to yourself. (laughs) <laughs> a lot of people wouldn't dare say that, but I would. Imagine if I, I didn't get saved in no crusade. I got saved uh, in a personal visitation that God came to me in somebody's house. I was a bodybuilder. I went to a health food store to get more mega protein and supplements yeah, there for my routines. And I found this health food store. And when I walked in there, the guy witnessed to me. And I cussed him out then, and I wasn't saved, okay? And I was like, you, what a, what are you, like religious or something? I was very offended. I said, what are you talking to me about this? I came here for this stuff. He just looked and he went, okay, okay. You know, like in the, in the, the mafia, you know, and they know they're going to get you. They just say, okay, sure, no problem. Have a good afternoon. And they smile, <laughs> knowing they're going to find you tomorrow, you know. And maybe have a sit down and have pasta and meatballs, you know. Hey, Tony, how you doing? Okay, when you're on the way out, bang. And the others go, he got whacked. You know, that's the way they'll smile at you. So the guy looked and smiled, you know. Sure enough, the Holy Spirit started drawing me to go back there to get more stuff. One day I drove, this, I'm trying to make a story short. One day I drove there, parked the car, it was hard to park, parked, I had this uh, hot rod, uh, a Cougar XR7, 74 with the 351 uh, Cleveland engine in it, the four, the, that hot rod engine. Beautiful car, it was a gold color with the brown top, two tones, gold and brown, you know. What a car that was, man. If you step on the pedal on that thing, even when you're driving fast, it would spin the wheels again. 
vroom, like, you know, the, the old muscle cars. It was like that. So that's what I was driving. My father bought that for me. Yeah, my father, my dad, bless him. He's in heaven. He bought that car for me. Bless him, Lord. I call it the Catmobile, the Cougar. What a car. I don't know if I have any pictures of that somewhere. I might. And uh, it was hard to park. Park the car, went in to the store, and I walked in, and I stood by the counter, and I, I had this, I looked puzzled. I was like, why did I come here? And they started to laugh. They were like, we know why you came here. <laughs> I thought, I don't need anything. And I walked back out. I felt so embarrassed. I thought, why did I come? Then I went again. Then they invited me to their house for something, and they put on this movie, like a, a, a health food party, whatever. It was weird. They had health people. They had the health food thing. The guy's wife and sister made all this stuff. The sister was uh, a, a lady who liked ladies, okay, in that lifestyle. The power of God fell on her and she turned red as a tomato and sweat was pouring off her head. And she was crying on the floor. She also got delivered right then when the Lord came for me. And the Lord walked in the room and came for me and I called his name. I got saved. Long story. And then went into this supernatural journey and the Lord started to appear to me. I got saved at somebody's house on a Friday night on August 22nd, 1986 at about 10 minutes to midnight on Locust Avenue, and I remember the address. It was 167 Locust Avenue, Dumont, New Jersey. Praise the Lord. I remember that. About 10 minutes to midnight on a Friday night, August 22nd, 1986. My life changed right there. So I didn't get saved in the crusade, okay? But what? And that man, that, that man of God, who's the owner of the health food store, I still talk to him. He's now moved out to California. He sold his properties in New York and uh, New Jersey and went to retire. He's in his 70s now. He told me he's 70-something years old. I'm like, oh, my God. <sighs> Let me just say something to everybody. We better hurry up. Some of you guys are people of kids. You, you're very young. I shouldn't be jealous, but... <laughs> I wish I could turn the clock back. If I could, I would, you know. But I, but I wouldn't want to be who I was then. I want to be, you know, knowing what I know now. Could you imagine being where I am now, knowing what I know now about everything, and then turning the clock back 30 years? Oh, my. Wouldn't that be great? The good old days. We call them, right? So Billy Graham said he, he wished he spent more time with his family. But all the people that got saved would argue with him. Say, would I have gotten saved if I didn't come to this crusade? I didn't even know I was coming. Someone brought me here, and then the Spirit convicted me. I didn't even know what the Spirit was. And I ended up in the front, and now I'm lifting my hands saying a prayer. My life changed. So that was good that he had that ministry. Look at Reinhard Bonnke, you know. He got shut out of Nigeria by someone from the other team who became the president a real blithering idiot who's probably burning in hell now. He's dead. And, uh, <laughs> and the door opened to him after nine years, and he had his greatest harvest there of tens of millions of souls saved. He, before he went to be with the Lord, they counted 75 million souls, Reinhard Bonnke's ministry brought, brought to the Lord. 75 million people born again under his ministry, and many of them in Nigeria. So the devil tried to shut the door on him, but Reinhardt didn't stop. They threw him in jail one time, you know, and he called a, another man of God friend. He said, he said, he called uh, this other guy. He said his name. He said, where are you, Reinhardt? He told him he's in the prison. <laughs> he got locked up for preaching the gospel. He, he, I don't think they kept him in there a couple days and he got out. He didn't quit. Say amen. amen. It doesn't matter what the devil tries to throw at you. You don't stop. And guess what? The biggest harvest you'll ever have is the thing that you don't relent on. You, 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 you can fall off it for a while like I was talking about, but you can't, you can't allow it allow any circumstances or any evil or any devil to stop you 
from doing your assignment. Lift your hands. Dominion, the power of it, the purpose of it, God's intention for it, is that we can take over. Joshua had the people that walked around Jericho for seven, six days were quiet and praying, and the seventh day they shouted and all the walls of Jericho, which were very thick, historically they were very thick, the whole thing fell flat and they were able to go in the city and do what they want. And the, 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 the principle there is Joshua 6.16, shout, the time to shout, shout for the Lord, watch this now, the Lord, not circumstances, not people, not human interaction, not luck or some kind of favor from somebody, the Lord, it says the Lord, has given you the city. And every time I see that scripture, I just begin to almost weep. I was in the city center, and I, I sat down, I did a message on that. The first time I had gone back to the city after a long time. I used to go to the city every single day years ago, when being in the city. Always in what you call the town, the town, the town center. Always there, all the time. Then I got tired of it. It became stressful. And I went back, and the power of God came on me. The minute I'm walking around, and the last time I was there, I took my, uh, my, my, my tripod here, my little handheld thing, and put this live thing on and just begin to do something. Everybody's looking, walking around, going, wow, they do that, you know. Yesterday I was walking. People start shouting when I'm walking in the street. They shout at me every time. Either they're saying, Jesus, Yesu, or somebody, lady called me Father Abraham. I said, thank you very much, Father Abraham. I was like, where'd you get that from? Okay, I'll take it. Then yesterday, I'm walking by this car, an ugly looking car. It, had, it was so hollow. I don't know if it was a pro box or what it was. You know, and uh, somebody yelled, hello, sir, and it echoed inside because <clears throat> the ceiling was so thin metal, you know. Thin uh, padding, you know. Hello, sir, it sounded like, and I look and I'm like, oh, God, hi. Then somebody sends me an Instagram post. I spotted Jesus in town today. <laughs> and they took a video of me walking in the street. I have that clip somewhere. It really, it really looks good. Because I actually went off the sidewalk into the street. I'm walking down the lines of the cars. I'm just striding along. And somebody in their car, stuck in traffic, took a video of me and posted it on Instagram. He said, I saw Jesus in town. <laughs> it doesn't stop. And then some, some two ladies were in another car behind that. They were like, I love your hair. Beautiful. I'm feeling annoyed. You know, like I'm walking. I'm thinking about where I'm going. I'm like, oh, God. I turn around. Okay. They were already gone. I couldn't see who they were. I just hear the voices everywhere. People saying, hello, sir, hello, sir, hello, sir, hello, sir. It's amazing. So I told a friend of mine, I said, you know, God gave us, God gave us a commission to do something. He, he's never changed his mind. Right? So you talk about God's timing. You see how stupid that is? God's timing. Oh, yeah. He forgot about what he said, and he wants to change the schedule for another date. Are you insane? Let your hands say, I repent. I've never done this before. I just want to, I'm saying it myself, myself. I, I'm, I'm, the, I'm, the, I'm the cheer, I'm the, the coach here. I'm the first guy with my hands up. I'm not telling you to do something I'm not doing. I'm not afraid to say it. We need to repent. Repent means change your mind. Rethink. Repent. P-E-N-T is the word for penthouse. Pentateuch, five, five books, books of Moses. Genesis. Uh, Exodus, Leviticus, I don't know saying it. Over. Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and what's the other one? Numbers. The five books. Was it Numbers? Yeah, I think. Leviticus, Exodus, Genesis, Deuteronomy, and Numbers, yep. Five senses, five. Sight, smell, taste, 
touch. What's the other one? Sound, hearing? I don't know. Yeah, five senses. Walter, there you are again. Hope you're staying with us, brother. Don't be a, a clicker, a scrolling man. Just listen to the message. And replay this. Replay this. I don't know you, but I'm just saying hi. Welcome on. Sophia, I see you there. Several other people. Let me greet and fill this. God bless you. You're back with us. Hey, uh, 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 Natasha, hello there. Naruba, Naruba, Nayar, that's a cool name. Where are you from? If you're still there. Waweru, hey Waweru. Rose, I see you there. You're writing something very good. Very good, very good, very good. Okay, so. The penthouse is the top floor. That is symbolic of your head. How you think. So to repent means to rethink. It means to do a full turnaround. Now some people don't... I, 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 how many can tell I'm under the anointing hand? I'm in a pretty good mood today. Is that good? Because I'm not like going to talk about the depths of the evildoers. I think I'm, you know... I'll slice them up with a sword by the Holy Ghost and laugh while I'm doing it, okay? But I'm not sad uh, at all. But um, the, uh, many evildoers don't repent. That's what I want to say. They don't repent. Thieves usually don't. Liars usually don't. Con artists usually don't. They usually don't. Bad for them. But can we worry about it? No. I had a doctor tell me on Thursday, I want to get some uh, tests done, checkups done, and my blood pressure, I have the paper, I have, no, I think I put it in my, in my office. I, I had a paper where they, the nurse wrote down all the stats of all of my visits there. And it was the lowest my blood, I said, is that machine broken? Is that machine right? Yes, it's right. I said, are you sure? Yes. My blood pressure was the lowest it ever was in history. In years and years and years. It was 117 over... 72, 116 over 72. I was like, are you kidding me? Do I have blood pressure? I'm healed of hypertension or whatever you call it, yeah. 116 over 72, are you kidding me? I remember one day I walked into a place and they had the machines in America and I took the thing and I felt like I was going to pass out because I don't know what I was. I, was I, I do know what I was stressed about. It was bad. Part of the warfare. You know, the warfare. Warfare Incorporated. Warfare.com, .org, .tv, you know. Warfare. My blood pressure was like 205 over 105. Somebody said, you're not supposed to be walking <laughs> with it that high. I said, yeah. I told this yesterday. One time I was driving. I was, talking to, I was talking to MJ on the phone. Remember that? She, she might not remember. I was talking to MJ on the phone from, uh, from America on the cell phone while I was driving. And I said, I feel like I'm going to pass out and I'm doing 75 miles an hour on the highway. I'm going dizzy, like I was going blind. I couldn't see. I had to pull the car over. It was scary. I said, what if it goes one more step and I lose consciousness? Guess what? I'd be swimming because I was going along the bay. <laughs> My car would become a boat, you know, I'd go off the road. I don't know what would happen. So I pulled over. I remember one time I, I was being attacked really bad and I felt like that, like that guy, that guy. I was going to pass out. High blood pressure. Your blood pressure goes up. Then I had, a, I had a, 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 an eye specialist tell me about blood sugar, how it affects the eyes. So I'm dealing with that. So I thought, okay. I got to get my blood pressure down. Let me, let me give you the wisdom principle he gave me because maybe this will help somebody else. I said, those pills that you take, the certain medicine. Now, you could do it naturally, and if you can't do that fast enough, use the medication, okay? Uh, it, you're quiet. You don't want to say nothing. You think God's just going to give you a miracle because you're lazy and you, and you just deserve everything. No. Get real. So I said, those pills, don't they have side effects? I heard about side effects, side effects, side effects. And here's what he said to me. Here's what he said to me. I'll never forget it as long as I live. He said, well, the side effects is like 
maybe 1% versus the effect of what's going on at 100%. I was like, say that again? I instantly made the decision. Get more of those pills, I'm taking them. One in the morning, one in the evening, 500 milligrams. So they evidently worked. Plus, I stopped taking so much intake of sugar. I'm cutting down on it anyway. It's not good to take sugar. It's very bad. Very Sugar is detrimental. It's poison to your health. Do you know what the doctor told me on Thursday? My, my physician. My, he's a very top specialist. He's a top in his field. Very nice guy. We're, we've become good friends. We always have a good fellowship every time. When I walk in, he lights up. Like, he didn't know it was me. And he's like, oh, wow, so good to see you. you know, I'm glad it's you. Uh, so we talked we talk for a long, too long, really, because he had a lot of, line of patients waiting. We, we took too long, I know. But he said to me, uh, I knew this before, but he, re, he said, one 300 milliliter, this is a 500 ml uh, bottle of water here, okay? This is really good water, spring water. I love this. It's from the mountains. This water is 500, is half a liter right here, 500 ml. He said a 300 ml, which is only up to about here, and they make the bottles a little rounded, of Coca-Cola has 13 teaspoons of sugar in it. 13. White sugar, bad sugar, not even the cane sugar, the nice brown sugar. One, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. And, 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 and as much sodium, a lot of sodium and other chemicals. They say you could take rusty metal and dip it in Coca-Cola, let it sit there, the rust will dissolve. And you're, you're drinking that into your gut, into your body. Are you insane? Number one, get rid of the soda. I did it many years ago. Thank God I did it. And I don't have my diet quite to where I want it to be, but I, I don't eat fried food. I don't eat chocolate. I don't, I'm trying to cut down on the sugar because it... Sugar's in a lot of stuff. You order a piece of carrot cake, which I love. It's full of sugar and oil and all that, the way they make it. So I'm going to commission my own team to make gluten-free, use the monkey fruit powder, you know, the monkey, monkey, the Asian plant, monk, it's called monk fruit. I call it monkey fruit because I like monkey so much. You know, monkey just makes me laugh. Boy, I was in the coast and they were everywhere. You walk down through the grass and they're you're walking like looking, I'm looking at my phone or I'm just looking down or I'm looking that way and all of a sudden I feel something, you know? You ever, something shows up and you just feel it and like your peripheral vision catches it? And I stop and I look and there's like six monkeys sitting there looking at me. Sitting there looking. One's moving this way on their bushes, the other one's just sitting down. I'm like, wow, hey. I'm from, I'm from New York City. You have to understand the phenomenon of these animals. We don't have any of them there. We never had anything like that. So that's why they're, they're such a, an amazing thing to me. One came in my hotel room. He, I opened the window and he, a little, little cheeky guy, he came in. He was going through all my things. I was asleep and he woke me up. And I woke up and I lifted my head and I looked and there he was. And they had this net around the bed, you know? So it's kind of a veil, so like it wasn't direct. And he, but he saw me, and he, but he kept at it. He's picking up things, and he's looking to see what he wants to take. And I had some supplements in and in a, in a big envelope. He picked the thing up in his mouth, and he went to the window. And just then I caught him, because I woke up. I said, hey! And he got scared. He, he shoulders went up, and he dropped the thing out of his mouth. And had all my vitamins in there. I said, you crazy little monkey, I'll catch you, I'll slap you upside your head. He jumped out the window, and then when he jumped, some of the things fell out the window down to the two, two floors down. I had to go outside down the grass and pick up all the little things that he was trying to steal. But I got it all back. He didn't get nothing. Somebody say, praise the Lord. Because <laughs> once they got it, you can't catch them again. I have another video I took. He jumped on the table and took the sugar packs and then threw the tin that they're in. And all of them, he put them in his mouth, he put them between his toes and the other ones in his hands and his fingers, and he stuffed all his toes with the sugar packs. And he went up the top and he started tearing them and pouring them like this. That monkey's going to have a blood sugar problem. 
I say, good, take the sugar away from my table. I don't need it. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Maybe that's a sign from God. The monkey stole the sugar. They, God's saying, there's a message in that. Don't take it. So, I, I saw the, so the, the, the nurse, they checked my blood sugar, and she poked me really hard. I almost screamed. She dug the thing in there. I said, ooh. And I said, hurry up. Then she says, oh, I have to like, clean this part first. And then I said, hurry up, because I know one time there's somebody that didn't know what they were doing. They did the thing, then they had to do it again, because the blood will clot and dry, and then you can't hit the, you know, the thing that they use to test the blood sugar. I said, hurry up, hurry up. It was 5.9. Can you imagine? I said, what's the normal range, 6 to 11? I beat it by one point. 5.9. You got to work on that stuff. Blood pressure, get it down. Blood sugar, keep it low. Don't let it get high, it'll destroy you. You know, it can even affect the eyesight, the eyes. Some people walk around, they don't know. You're going to these junk places. I'm so annoyed. Yesterday, it was yesterday. I made one mistake. I don't, I'm not afraid to say it. I will never do it again. They had something two for one at the greasy joint, you know? The place is synonymous with co coffee called, <laughs> it, it rhymes with Hava, Java. So they had this special two for one for this. I thought, ah, I really feel, I really feel like I want to eat something. So what could I do? Maybe I'll take a shot at it, you know. And of course, they had greasy French fries. I said, don't make, make sure the French fries are not greasy, you know. So I took a couple of bites into the thing, and even the meat wasn't so good. It wasn't that well. I said, what did I do this for? Never again. I threw the whole thing in the trash. I said, sorry, I wasted. Seven dollars or whatever. I won't do it again. People eat that stuff, they think it's okay. Oh, take the kids, let's go. What do you want? Chips. Please, people, get delivered from that. Let the kid learn to eat salad. I told someone I want kale and celery and all these green things, so they made this juice for me. I drank the whole thing, it's delicious. Lemon and ginger and all these other fruits. Do, take those, vegetables, take those. Genesis 1.28, the dominion chapter. Right after the dominion verse, he said, all these seeds and trees, whatever, I've made for bearing fruit, to multiply, that she can have to eat those things. That's the way it was in the garden. They didn't have fried chips and fried burgers and cakes full of oil. You know the muffins that they sell? Sometimes you like, I like the carrot muffins because it has carrots in it. You think that's a little bit healthy. Then you realize it's full of grease and sugar. Lift your hand and say, Lord, I repent. You're not supposed to put that thing into yourself. That's one of the reasons you need to be prosperous because you need money to buy everything good organically. Say amen. Come on, i got to get off this topic. I'm going, I'm going. The, the Spirit of the Lord, really speaking. So, soda, too much sugar, all that stuff, get rid of it. Something I wanted to talk about here, moving along. Uh, Daniel, before I do that, I want to give you a definition. Thank you, Lord. Definition of dominion. It means sovereign to your control. It's man's attempt to establish dominion over something, nature, situations, circumstances. A, a, a good definition, the number one noun, is sovereignty or control. It also means the territory of a sovereign or a government. But guess what? We're sovereigns and we're governments. Kings and priests unto the Most High, Revelation 1.6, yeah? Yeah? Okay, I want to ask you a question. Which word, is more, which word is more similar to dominion? Subjectivity or supremacy? Yeah, so you see, that, you see it's, a sarcastic, it's a sarcastic question. Subjectivity. P 
People become subject to everything, cultures, situations, other people's thoughts, other people's ideas, and then God has a dream for you. And let me tell you how you become very rich and very successful when you, by your uniqueness. You want to accentuate your uniqueness and you want to accentuate your aggressive mentality and behavior. If you're not going to take it by force, how are you going to get it? Matthew eleven twelve says, the kingdom of heaven permits aggression and the aggressive take it by force. I don't like to necessarily use the word violent because you can't do physical violence in our day. It's against the, you know, it's against the rules, you know? Even though sometimes you'd like to, yeah? But you're not supposed to do that. So I, 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 I put, paraphrasing it, put aggress aggression there. The kingdom of heaven permits aggression and the aggressive take it by force. Supremacy over what? Everything. It's power, authority, jurisdiction, control, command. The right to govern and rule and to determine things, to make decisions about things. It also implies possessions and ability to wield force, authority, and influence. Is that powerful? And that's in the first chapter of the first book of the Bible. God said, my image is this, and I'm putting it in you. Here's the part a lot of people miss. They think it's an optional thing. Well, God wants to have dominion, but you know, the case is what? God said, it's my nature, and I've given it to you as your nature. But guess what? Everything in the world system, philosophies, cultures, devils, Families, situations, whatever, wants to suppress that in you and make you subject to them. A proof of that is when the, when, the, when, the, when the pandemic happened and they shut everybody down and everybody cowered and feared and bowed down. I say, Lord, I repent. <laughs> Lift your hand unless you're, unless you're crazy. Please repent. I repent. Me, Thomas, I repent ever letting that affect me. Whatever the devil tries to say, do, do the opposite. Whatever he tries to tell you to do, not to do once, do it five times. And I tell you, God has backed up two major ministries in America. One was major, and the other one wasn't, and became major now, because he took a stand against that tyranny and kept going, and they said, they said to everybody, do what you will, but I'm not going to stop. And these men of God have said now, no matter what they try to do again, until Jesus comes, they will never close their ministry down, ever, for any reason. Do what you want to do. You know the guy, do what you want to do. Remember the guys in Canada that they arrested, persecuted, beat, abused, ridiculed them? surrounded their properties with police cars and all that. It looked bad. It was horrible. But guess what? All of those guys have gotten out now. The cases have been thrown out. Time, time will tell. And the fact that they stood up for what's right, God is exalting them and promoting them. When you stand up for what's right against the tide, God will promote you. I've done it. When you see me rise, be close to me so you could be like an Elisha. i just tell you that. I'll give you a hint. Uh, when, I'm, when I'm going uh, up, 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 be close to me and you can get blessed. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And all the ones outside, oh, yeah, we know that prophet. Like they talked about Elijah. Hey, your master is going up today. You lackey, you kiss up, you, you servant boy. Oh, you think you're slick, Elisha? Yeah, they, they mocked him. Guess what? They stayed on the outside and the Bible never gives any of their names. But Elisha received the double portion. And 16 notable miracles were done through the ministry of Elijah, documented in the book of 1 Kings into the book of the 2 Kings. From the 17th chapter, Elijah appears on the scene, Elijah the Tishbite, and went on to about 2 Kings 4, whatever it was, and talks about many notable miracles that happened through him, including the slaying of the prophecy over Jezebel, that she would die and be eaten by dogs. She was. Her own staff threw her out the window. Jezebel, the big evil ruler, threatening 
terrorizing everybody. And Elijah, Elijah suffered under that in his own soul, you know, his own life. But he prophesied. Look at me. Have I prophesied against people? Mm. Hint, hint, have I? Waiting for all the amens to die down. You people got a blood sugar problem? I just try to tell you how to get over it. You up and down? Is this your crash time? Eat a piece of fruit. You got some mangoes here. Pass the mangoes around, y'all. People going into a coma. Get the cappuccinos coming out here. You're looking at me like, huh? Have I prophesied against anybody? Are you awake? You don't want to say nothing. Has it happened? Did they attack? Uh huh. Did they still lose? Uh huh. Are they still the biggest loser ever now, more than ever? Uh huh. Are they pretty much finished? Yeah, uh huh. Now, more than before? Uh huh. So, what's the problem? Now, a few people come out of the woodwork years later and say, oh, yeah, you know, I thought that too, you know. But you weren't there standing in front of thousands of people when I said it in 2007. When it looked like that was their heyday. Now their heyday is what? What day? What day is it? <laughs> it's nighttime. <laughs> Lights have gone out. Why? Because God's using his prophet to speak creatively to rescue 50 plus million people in a nation and a future generation. Because you get the wrong person in power, they'll destroy the whole thing. And it would have reverberation effects across all of, all of this region of the world and all of the whole entire continent. Yes or yes? And it didn't happen and it will never happen. So, do I get a reward for that? Yeah, I got my, I got my hands up, Lord, thank you. Fill it all. Fill my treasuries. I take all of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Millions and millions, countless millions and billions. Yeah, mine. If you do nothing, what have you done? Nothing. If you don't do anything, what have you done? Nothing. And God said in Hebrews 6.10, I'm not unjust to forget your labor of love. I'll reward you. Go down a few verses, Abraham pops up. There's the key word, Abraham, the trigger word. Abraham, when the minute it talks about Abraham, that means financial blessing. Anytime Abraham, I've, I've looked at this many places. Isaiah quoted him, talked about bless, blessed him and increased him. Blessed and increased, key words. In Isaiah 51, verse 1, talk, Isaiah the prophet talking about Abraham. Anywhere you see Abraham pop up, it's a trigger word for financial blessing. Galatians 3.13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. And it says some other things in there, but let, let me cut to the next point. Uh, that the blessings of Abraham would come upon us. That's financial blessing. It's also a father power, a nation taking power. Amen. And that's living in the life of dominion. Can you say amen? Opposite of dominion is submission, subjection, servility, subordination, subservience, acquiescence. In other words, you, you, you acquiesce, you give up. Yeah, Lord, earlier in the message I wanted to talk about this one thing. Perish, you'll perish. The word perish means to spoil and, and lose your grip. Without a vision, people perish. Remember Proverbs 29, 18. Without a vision, my people perish. Meaning not just drop dead in a minute, but slowly waste away. Slowly lose your power. You lose your grip. You begin to let go of the sword. Slowly. It doesn't happen in one shot. It's a deception. It's a thing. It's like the frog you put in the cool water and have the flame underneath. The frog will stay in there. It's still warm. He's like, wow, it's getting warm. Next thing you know, it hits boiling point. They're done. They don't know to get out. 
So it's a slow process. It's a slow boil. It's a slow... And the devil doesn't mind trying to take time. And his ugly friends too. They don't mind trying to take time to set you up. From wherever it comes from, whatever side it comes from, to make you lose your grip and slowly begin to waste away and perish. And God gave us a promise also in Isaiah 41, 11. He said, those that hate you will be ashamed and disgrace themselves and they'll become as nothing. You'll look for them and not find them. But if they strive with you, keep fighting you, they will even perish. This is thus saith the Lord. They'll perish. Meaning they'll die slowly or quickly, whatever. Akuna <laughs> Shida. Let it happen. Forgiveness is a gift you give yourself. You forgive, don't hold grudges, forget about them. Something else the doctor told me, some advice. That was one doctor that told me. 1% possible side effects. You know he was from India, okay, the way he talked. All right. 1%. The possible side effects is better than 100% of the problem. I was like, God, you're a wise man. Thank you. I got the answer. Got to take a risk sometimes to take care of things, you know. And the other doctor said to me on Thursday, he said to me, what's causing you any stress? Anything that's causing you any stress? Forget about it. Get away from it. Pull back out of it. I was like, I, we think we know that. It sounds obvious, right? But we don't do it enough. Lift your hands and say, I repent. If you allow stress to come to you, you allowed it to come to you. God didn't give it to you. The devil did. And his ugly friends. Evil doers. They, sometimes the height, they took their best shot. They wanted to kill you so bad. They hurt you so bad. They shot so viciously. They did such despicable things, criminal things, that it's hard to even get that out of your system. It takes time, but you have to work on that. I remember years ago, this will help somebody. I'm telling a lot on myself. Years ago, I was in America, and I kept having this recurring vision going on. Some horrible events that had happened, some attacks that happened, some, and all the details, the process. I was seeing it like a video in my head. And then I think about what I would do to those people to take revenge, okay? In my mind, this video was like playing. And I thought, a th if I thought a thousand times, I, <laughs> okay, I repent myself now. If you did it, then you lift your hands too, but I'm saying for myself. <laughs> and I thought about what I, how I would do them, how I would torture them, how I'd break them to pieces, how I, I thought about all of it. It went through my head. And then I'd see it again, and I'd see it again. I'd go to sleep. I'd wake up thinking about it. This went on. This was around the time after another episode of a really bad situation happened. It was terrible. I mean, it was beyond terrible. And then one day I thought, wait a minute. This is not natural. Like my spirit discerned. You know, like Paul, when he saw that woman, was saying, these are the servants of the Most High God. Like it was a good thing. He said, wait a minute. That's a demon talking. Shut up and come out of her. Like it, it, it jumped in him one day. It didn't jump before. It was going on for a while. And then one day, wait a minute, hey, something's up here. I thought, this is not natural. So I cursed that thing. I said, I turned, I switched this off. You foul devil that's causing these thoughts in my head. Go in Jesus' name and never come again. From that day, I tell you before God, I never had the thought again. It was a demon. Lift your hands. Say, Lord, deliver me from everything. The devil tries to assign things to you, to mess you up, to keep talking to you, to keep uh, hurting negative thoughts. Let me tell you, any negative thought or negative word from someone didn't come from God. I got scripture to prove it. I'm not just saying that as a philosophy or a thought. Every word of prophecy was inspired by God. It didn't come from the impulse of men or the desire of men. It came as holy men of God spoke by the Holy Ghost. That's in the book of Peter. But another scripture says prophecy 
is given for comfort and exhortation and edification. Yes or yes? So if it doesn't give you a positive feeling and result, now God can correct you and convict you on something, the things you need to adjust and change, and you just say, Lord, I repent. There it is again. Help me. But a real word from God will encourage you. Even if it's a spirit, I have one man of God, he said, is a great man of God, a very famous preacher in the kingdom, uh, was talking with him, and he, he gave him, he told him something that was negative. And he thought about it after a while. And even that man of God who was anointed was able to speak something negative to him. He said, wait a minute. That's not comforting me. And he got a, like a little bit of a complex about it. That someone else was going to tell him, they were going to tell him something. He thought, oh, here it comes. <laughs> it's going to tailgate. He's gonna, this guy's going to tailgate on that other thing. He said, wait a minute. And he got to rebuke the whole thing, get it out of himself. Says, and the scripture came to him. Prophecy is for exhortation, edification, comfort, confirmation. It's not to uh, condemn you. Another scripture is, is Romans 8, 1. There is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, verse 2, who walk it according to the spirit of, uh, of, of life in Christ Jesus, not the spirit of death. Life in Christ Jesus. And, become, and you become free from the law of sin and death. Sin and death, destruction, negativity, those are all evil. God is not negative. Even when, even when he corrects you, he does it, you feel happy after he corrected you. And you know for your own good, I have to change something, I have to adjust something. But you don't feel like sad and depressed and beaten down and, you know, belittled. Hello, manipulated, undermined, cursed. No. Some, have you ever, this is a bit painful, ha, too, too, many, too many people and many of us. Ha, have you seen people that succeed because they had very good positive affirmations from their parents growing up and they just seem to do like really great and everything from an early age? And then you see other people that it takes a long time to figure out because they had to figure it out with God because they didn't have that affirmation in their home. They didn't have that environment. Very sad. Don't you wish you could, we could turn it back and make it different? I remember one time I was on national television. I'm telling some stories today. Oh, my God, help. I was on national television. They said the audience was 33 million viewers on the BET network. A black entertainment television network in America. At the time, this is in the 80s, was uh, 90s, uh, 90s, yeah, 90s. And uh, I was interviewing people on the street, uh, it's a ministry thing I was doing, and they were they were airing on the on the on the BET network. They said it's 33 or 30, 33 million or 36 million, whatever it was, potential viewers. And I wanted to show my mom the video, and she couldn't come and watch it. She was doing something else. That hit me like a like a like a knife. I can't tell you how how, how, how bad I felt. And I thought this is a big moment I'm having, and she doesn't even care. But later in life. We got real together, and then now she's in heaven with the Lord. Lift your hands. Praise the Lord. It all, if you stick with the process, it all ends up good. All right? But in our family, we, we would, you know, most families, a lot of families are pretty dysfunctional. We didn't have all that affirmation. Sometimes you see your father, you feel nervous. Instead of like, hi, Dad, you're like, oh, my God, what did I do now? You know what I mean? That's bad. So that'll, that'll, that'll shave some time out of your schedule. Let's say a kid, I, I saw this kid, uh, I'll, I'll tell you a funny example about that. This kid, now this kid's walking in Dominion, I think he's a heathen. He makes $30 million from YouTube. A 10-year-old kid. I found the clip, I was appalled, I was shocked. I was like, oh my God. I said it to someone, I said, this is beyond astounding. You know who helps him do the channel? His father. Can I tell you another one? The kid make, and he, and he represents, it's stupid stuff. It's, I mean, that's the, I don't want to say the word, silly. You know, to us as adults, it's like kids' toys and 
thinks for many. And he even got such a brand going that now he represents manufacturers and he makes millions of dollars from them. The kid is 10 years old. And he's, he's being paid tens of millions of dollars from other entities as well as the 30 million he made from YouTube. He's 10 years old. His father helped him set him up. His father's a tech genius and he loves the kid and they do this thing. And they have all these toy markets. He'll, and he's just explaining on his YouTube, this is his YouTube channel. He explains things about these toys, what they do, and all the other kids watch. And he gets so many hundreds of millions of views, he gets paid all that money. He's 10 years old. Oh my God. Could he have done that without his father? Please don't say yes. Could he have done that without his father? Absolutely 100 trillion times N-O. Impossible. He never could have thought of that. He had the thought. His father saw the thing. He helped him. Why don't we do this? And let you, you be the front man. His dad's like that. The kid's like an adult when he's 10 years old. Mega millionaire. Jesus in heaven. Can you believe it? Can you believe it? It's hard to take that one. It's like, wow, I'm not, I don't mean competitively or being jealous. No, I mean, I'm happy for them. If they, uh, we make our own money, praise the Lord. We have our own arenas and uh, entrepreneurial, whatever we do. Or whatever we, I, I'm, I'm not hating on the kid, but it's just pretty amazing. I'm happy. When people succeed, it makes me happy. I think I'm beyond it now, but years ago I might have said something like, let the kid get saved and know me and tie it to my ministry. <laughs> Send me the time. Now I don't even think like that. I just, I believe in God for so many, so many things. And so many things are happening. Another example, you ready? Tiger Woods became the richest man in the golf game. He's, he's a billionaire. He's worth over a billion dollars. Made over a billion. Why? W-H-Y. One answer, his father. Took him out to play golf when he was two years old. Got him the little baby golf sticks, golf clubs. And he started swinging at two years old. They have the video, you can see the video. Tiger Woods. And his father was with him. every match, everything. When he became the champion, he was always there rooting him on behind him. And Tiger had that extra confidence drawn on him from his father. Could he have done all that without his father? No. Let me tell you one self-made guy. Take it over in the other room. Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan was told when he was 17 years old by his coach in the college he was in, whatever, that he was no good. Give up basketball, kid, because you're, you're not any good at it. Can you believe it? Can you believe the foolish, the foolish guy that told him, Michael Jordan, he was no good. Michael Jordan went and said, okay, yeah, you say I'm no good? And he went and he started doing like thousands of free throws. Shaq O'Neal, you know Shaquille O'Neal, Shaq. He does, he, they say he would do 500 free throws before breakfast in the morning, five, six o'clock in the morning. 500, 500 in the morning when people are still asleep, then he'd go have breakfast. Every day he did that, and you wonder why he became such a champion in the, in the basketball. Michael Jordan did that, he, he, he trained himself, he self-taught himself, he built his own confidence. He didn't have a good coach. So that tells me, which is really, really, it's really good news, isn't it? That we could still do it no matter what situation we had. You might say, my father was mean. My father was not there. My father, I don't even, some people could say, I don't even know who my real dad was. Come on, lift your hands. There's hope with God. This guy from the world said, y'all are against me. Y'all want to fight. Y'all want to hate. God is for me, so I'm going to do more. Is that a revelation? That's a dominion principle right there. I take the hand of God and we walk together, him and me. I think I should stop that. That's enough. I got, I got like, I got like 40 pages. I got like 30 pages of notes. Forget it. Let me give you one quick scripture the Holy Ghost gave me and we'll wrap this up. Are you blessed? 
My God. Uh, Daniel chapter 4. I want to talk about the power of, of, of what Daniel walked in. He got it from God. Doesn't say he got it from anybody else. Nebuchadnezzar the king, to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth. <clears throat> this was a, 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 a Nebuchadnezzar's second dream. And he was addressing it to the whole earth. And, I, and Daniel was speaking here. Uh, yeah. Peace be multiplied to you. I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked for me. Make a note of that. Daniel 4, verse 3. Or 2, is it 2? I can't see. 2. I thought it good to declare here the signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked for me. How great are his signs, verse 3, and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. And then it goes on to talk about Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And of course, we know Daniel was instrumental in uh, helping that. And Nebuchadnezzar exalted himself and the Lord made him become like an animal on all fours, eating the grass to humble him. But Daniel was right there as the wise sage, the prophet, and the man carrying the glory of the kingdom. I, I, I don't want to take time, but if you go through the book of Daniel and you go through other places of the Bible, look at Solomon. So Solomon also, another example of the father thing, he had David. Would Solomon have gone as far as he did without David? Absolutely not. From where did he have the reference point to do all that? He just wakes up one day and then goes and builds this great thing. You know, a lot of what Solomon got, he inherited from David. A lot of the things that David wanted to do, God said, you can't do it. I'm going to have your son do it. God was talking to David. He wasn't talking direct to Solomon yet. In fact, the first time we see in the scripture where God spoke directly to Solomon was when he burnt a thousand offerings in a, in, a, in a rage of a passion to please God. And God was very pleased. He came back and talked to him directly. Before that, he was talking to David. And David gave him so many things to do. Solomon learned a lot of things from his father David. And he went right into it. So I want to say this to encourage everybody. Whether you have that, you know, mentor, whatever, I'm glad to be everybody's mentor, whoever the Lord feels uh, w w he would direct in that way, because I, I want to see you succeed. So you have me. I, I, I love to pray for people. I'd love to help you and teach. And I love teaching the Word of God. That's obvious. And, and let's continue in this thing. But where, regardless of wherever you came from, there's hope yet. Lift your hands. Say, Lord, I repent of ever thinking otherwise. And we need mentors or mistakes. Two ways you can learn. The latter is, is, a, is, is a waste of time. Two ways you can learn. Expertise of others or your own experience. The school of hard knocks where you got to figure it out all yourself or other people that have gone ahead of you. I don't know how I get answers for things. Somebody came to me with a complex situation. In two seconds, I had the answer, and I told them exactly what to do. Do this, do this, do this, do this, this. Get on it. Just like the bishop said over the evangelist. You know. The things you've done so far, good, but re remarkable you haven't seen yet. Now go and do the things I've taught you and get busy with it. And he did, and it's working for him. I, told, I had the answer instantly. It wasn't like, I have to pray, but let's pray, you know? It's a meme that I had. I don't know if I posted it yet. If I didn't, I still have to. I think I might, it might have slipped me. <clears throat> I have this picture of a lady who's praying with her hand up like that, praying. There's, there's a message here. It says at the top, many people will not understand this. They won't get this. And she's praying, and there's a little leaf coming out of a potted, a potted plant, you know, a little pot. A little leaf that's withered over, and like a stem of a thin stem of the, the branch, the twig coming up, whatever, the plant. 
And then the split screen. Right side is the same lady, okay? And says so this one, the same lady, same person, is watering this thing. Yeah? Working it. And the plant is big, tall, as tall as her, and with big leaves coming out of it. And the top says, many people won't get this. And some people say, I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying all day. Prayer is not the only... Prayer is not the only way you get answers to things. Prayer is how you get the, an the direction from God. Now you got to get busy and take action. The prayer alone doesn't do it. You get it? What if I said, I want to have this meeting and I'm praying about it? Where will we be today? I didn't bring the television cameras and all the things here. Everybody say, what? Well, how are we going to get it done? I'm praying. Lord, you know. Lord, you help. He looks at you like, are you nuts? The part that's on us is much more than we think. Lift your hands. Say, Lord, I repent for every other thinking otherwise. Or, or, or just say, Lord, I apologize if I didn't yet know. Some people don't know. It hasn't really occurred to you, and now I'm bringing it out. So it, I can't blame you if you didn't think about it. God's having me think about it and teach this and release it upon you. The fact that you didn't think about it enough doesn't make you bad. Just catch it right now. The part that's upon us is more than... If you don't do it, it's not going to happen. Guess what? Here it is again. If I, do, if I don't do anything, what have I done? Answer, nothing. And then how do you expect God to say, well done? Everybody needs to step up the game. One thing that will never kill you is hard work, if you do it smart. If you do it too wrongly, you can get tired. But sometimes you get energized as you do. I don't want to do less. I want to do more. I repent. There's a lot of repentance going on here. <laughs> Am I in a repentance rally? I told people years ago when I first saw these repentance meetings. You know these big repentance meetings around here? You know the big repentance meetings? You know, go rent the big place and have thousands of people come in and cry. Said the Indian industrialists made the tissue boxes. They're happy. They like you. You're buying a lot of their stuff. Yeah? Mr. Uh, Chandaria, whatever his name is. Manu. You know, Manu is making money. Yeah? Selling the, the processed paper boxes. Yeah? You're like, woohoo! Then you stop blowing your nose and making noise. <laughs> and God says, what? So I, here's what I thought. This was years ago. I'm talking back uh, uh, 15 years ago, yeah, when I first stumbled on this repentance thing here. Repenting of, you, mean, you, re, you need to repent for yourself, as I said, not for other people. You had nothing to do with what they did. You curse it, break it, prophetically pray that it won't happen again. The most powerful prayer, I want to give you a secret. The most powerful type of prayer is prophetic prayer, which includes declarations. I'm speaking by the Spirit, not just in my communing with God, which is fellowship and worship. That's very important to have. I'm not sidestepping that at all. That's a bigger part of it as anything, your intimacy with God. That's where he anoints you. That's where he talks to you. That's where he downloads the blueprint and the architectural plan for your life, your ministry, your business. That's where you get it from. Very, very important. I have to emphasize that. I'm not sidestepping that. But as important to that afterwards, it's not just like, Lord, you know, Lord, you know. He says, yeah, I know, but what are you going to do about it? And you begin to proclaim you know, there, 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 was a, there was a, I don't want to lose my last thought. The repentance, let, let me get to that in a minute. Transformation, just remind me if I, if I forget a little bit. Transformation, just, just tell me the word transformation, I'll, I'll get it back. I don't want to get off this topic because I, I need to finish the point. The repentance thing, here's what I thought. I said, we all need to repent for about a good 10, 15 minutes, yeah? If you cry and get emotional, okay, make the Indians happy. You buy their tissue boxes. No problem, man. Akuna Matata. Yeah? Bon Asafiwe Mugunda Moyam. Akuna Shida. Yeah? You can go as Mashenzi as you want, you know? Acting crazy, crying. If you could fall on the floor, you can. Whatever you want to do, right? 
But then after that, get up and do something about the problem. Are you, are you getting that? God gave me this when I first ran into it. Not last week, last year. I'm talking about 15 plus years ago. In the year 2007. When I first ran into all this repentance talk, I thought, repent, good. Pray, cry. Apologize. Confess. But you're better off doing it for yourself because God can have the individual account with you in your life and begin to work with you. You're not just throwing it off on somebody else. Are you seeing that? And then I said, now next you got to start to address the problem. Get up and start declaring. I did it. I was in KICC. The vice president was sitting in a chair. I saw the presidential escort vehicles. I thought the president, I thought it was the president here. No, it was the vice president, the, de the vice president the time and uh, there was only one chair in the place it was his empty chair so I came I I felt like I was late but the Lord had me be late sometimes that can happen I felt like I was late I don't I don't excuse being late but uh, that day I just was delayed I couldn't the Lord so the vice president left the meeting and then he had, there was one chair up in the front and then I sat they sat me in his chair where he was the vice president you see this fruit here? It's a problem. If you want to guess who it was. You see this fruit here? All right, some of you will get that later. I can't say that live. Please, no, no. I, be nice. Be careful, Prof. Okay. You see that? So the presidential motorcade takes off. I drive in in my Mercedes right up to the front. God blessed me with that car. S class, customized, beautiful, beautiful. I could say something else, but I won't say it right now. And uh, something good any, about that. Anyway, so I park there, and the, you know, leave my car there, walk in, sit down. And then they asked me to come up and speak. And I look at some of the leaders, they were looking at me with a snarl on their face. I thought, are y'all full of hatred? Y'all hate me because I'm anointed? Y'all hate me because of the favor of God? And you know what happened? The guy who was the, the head of the meeting, he's dead today. He died. He backslid and got into all kinds of stuff. It's so sad. People want to destroy preachers. The devil wants to destroy, and, and he works hard at it. You know what I mean? Lift your hands and say, Lord God, please, anything that affected me in any way, take it from my life. Let me get on with the program that you have for me now, strongly and fiercely more than ever before, in Jesus' name. So I got up on the platform. There's 1,500 people. There's 1,500 people sitting at round tables. The venue seats about 5,000. The main ballroom and the, 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 head, the government headquarters. You know that big, uh, the Salvo ballroom? And it's got about 1,500 people, round tables sitting around. And I, they gave me the mic and I said, the Lord says there's 222 people here that my hand is upon. I thought about it afterwards. I was like, ooh, what about the other 1,300 people? Preachers, bishops, reverends, evangelists, pastors with collars and all that. Sitting there like. And, I, and they were trying to do some repentance too, you know. I said, Okay. I think they did it before I got there, thank God. I had time to really speak, you know. And I said a lot of things. I, I said so many things, I can't remember all of them. They were looking at me like this. Like one guy, the head guy, he's dead now too. He's dead too, by the way. The, 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 the apostle, he's, he's gone. Looking at me like this. They never said hello. I thought, what's with these people? They, are they, is that how they are? Anyway. The Lord said, 222 people I'm going to use. In other words, he's saying, the other 1,300 I'm not. And I asked one bishop, who is a funny guy, and not in a good way. Uh, I said, how, how did you get this place full? How did you get 1,500 preachers to come here for this meeting? How? And he looked at me like with a smirk, and he said, it's, the answer's so easy, free lunch. I thought, you lazy barrels of hot air. 
I didn't, wouldn't touch that food. I don't know what they're serving in that place. I don't know who put what in that food or who did what. I didn't come for that. They sat me in the vice president's seat. And then I got up to speak. And then when it was done, I walked out. When I finished speaking, I walked out. I went right back to my car and drove away. People thought, what happened here? It's like a whirlwind hit the place. Lift your hands. That's what it's supposed to be in our life. Not just me. Yes, I'm anointed. Yes, God's head is upon But God's head is upon you. Everywhere you set your foot, God's given it to you. Joshua 1.3. Everything you set your hand to. Deuteronomy 28, the part of the promise. Everything you set your hand to is supposed to prosper. You, you're supposed to be blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed when you come in, blessed when you go out. Everything you do prospers. And you'll lend and not borrow. You'll be the head and not the tail. Come on, somebody. That's for you, as well as it's for me. The plan of God has never gone anywhere. He wants us to take dominion. Let's pray. Father, I give you praise for this word, this revelation. Yesterday on replacing waiting with acceleration, we can do that by putting our foot pedal to the metal, so to speak. That was one of the definitions of acceleration. Putting things into motion, spinning the tires, burning the rubber, moving, getting on the road, rising up to take action. It's not you. This is a rude awakening. It's a, it's a, it's a hard revelation to get when God begins to come and speak this and really challenge you and convict your heart. That it's not up to him to get everything done. We have to stand up and get moving. We have to stand up and get busy. As they say, stand up and be counted. I don't even like that one. Be counted for what? By, I'm a number? I don't need to be counted. I need to, I need to produce fruit. Jo Jesus said in John 15, 16, the last verse of that uh, 15 chapter, I think it is, he said, you will bear fruit and your fruit will remain. We're to bear fruit. Remember Psalm 1 said, your, tree, your leaves will not wither. You'll bear fruit, even in famine time. No matter what's going on, you're to keep bearing fruit. Psalm 1. And don't get caught up with the evildoers, because they'll trip you up. Don't stand in the seat of the, uh, the scornful, the, uh, the, uh, the ungodly, with the sinner. Don't be, it, and that could also be church people that are going the wrong way. I have a friend uh, who's a prophet, and he was telling his story on YouTube. He was telling the story of uh, how these preachers that he was even buying lunch for, food for, they're sitting at his table. They're conspiring how to destroy him. You have people like that all around. I heard another story uh, last week about people that were directors in, in, in a church. They undermined the senior man and stole the ministry for him in the, in the, in the, in the corporate uh, structure. I thought those people... Those people are not going to make heaven. You're a dead man. You do that in the face of a man. And I asked the man who told me the story. I said, are, is that man called of God? Is he anointed? Yes. And they want to sit his, his supposed friends right in his own church, lying in his face and undermining him and stealing the money and stealing the accounts because the man of God made one mistake. He says, I just want to pray and I'll leave the business to others. No, 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 no. If you're running an organization, you need to know everything. What does it know the state of your flocks? You know that one? Look at the, count up the cost and everything. Know what's going on. Know those who labor among you. Always be watching. You'll learn that. Some people will learn that the hard way. I, I repent. <laughs> Let's repent. You learn the hard way. You got to be more on top of things. Can't leave it to others. That's the one loophole that he gave. And the, but those people doing so wickedly, and I said, and this is going on, you hear story after story after story of corruption and sin and evil and debauchery and perversion and undermining and hatred and malice and jealousy and attack. Hello, in the church. So I said, no wonder the Holy Ghost is nowhere to be found in a lot of places. Some places Ichabod's been written over them. The Lord's departed from them. But is that our problem? No. Can I repent for them? No. Can I repent for myself? Yes. Are you seeing this? Can I rise up and take dominion myself? It's my responsibility to do it. I can't concern myself with what others are doing. Lift your hands and say, Lord, I repent forever 
getting too busy in other people's matters and thinking it has some reflection on me. And for any way I cast a spell upon myself in a wrong way, or I, I gave myself a, a, div, a division, a distraction, a derision, a, a derailment, off of the thing, the high calling of God that you put upon me, and I've gotten away from it in any way because of anybody. I was wrong to do that, and I repent and I apologize. The power of dominion, what God is in, his intent, what God's intention is in it, is for you to take over. Every industry you're in, every arena you're in, every business you're believing to build up more, whatever ministry you're doing, if whatever your calling is, whether it be ministerial or entrepreneurial or in a career or in a thing, whatever you're putting your hand, my God, I feel the Holy Ghost power here right now. Whatever you're doing, get busy about it. Wherever you're working, do more. Help the leader. Help the organization go further. Do it right now from today, tomorrow. Kick it into motion. Let's get on with things. I release the fire of God upon everybody right now to do more from today. Now watch my words. Not just to be blessed more. You say, God's just going to bless me. I'm just okay. I'm just waiting for that thing to come to me. I'm just waiting for that thing to happen to me. Uh, happen for me and happen to me. No, you, God can do a lot of things for you and he does want to, but you have to rise up. And I want to prophesy, as you walk, you will prosper. If you stay still, you'll stay stuck. If you get up and unstick yourself, get yourself unstuck, begin to move and do something, the Lord will see your tenacity and your faith and your action and say, I'm going to bless him because he's moving. They always had the saying in the world, you want to get something done, give it to a busy person. You think they're too busy already, but no, maybe they could do more because they they're used to getting a lot done. But the, the person that doesn't do anything, they can't get anything done. The diligent hand makes rich. Lift your hands. The diligent person gets blessed. Even seeking God, Hebrews 11.6, he said, by being diligent, you'll get blessed. Diligence is what? Excellent work. Smart work, brilliant work, doing many things. Doing many things and not waiting for anything. Lift your hands up to the Lord and say, God, please help me right now. From today, everything will begin to switch forward into another dimension. From today. From today. My life goes into a trajectory of advancement and increase. As I was teaching yesterday, you need to go back and watch that message. Two hours long, but it's worth the time. You'll never be the same after watching all of that. Some people, that's another thing. Somebody told me, they said, people, they don't want to sit under anybody. They're too independent. They think they know everything. No, you don't. I, maybe I have some work to do in this area. Let's pray right now together as a corporate uh, group. Father, I just command right now that you'll shake loose the people that need to be with us. And they'll, get, they'll humble themselves and they'll sit down and they'll listen to me. And they'll let me train them and bless them and help them and teach them. And they'll be touched by this anointing. Maybe I have something to do in that to invoke that. Maybe I haven't. I repent, okay? Again, I, I may, I'm sure we haven't done enough in that arena. We need to do it. The juniors, I said, be careful with the juniors. You know, the juniors, they think they know everything. They just want to climb the ladder. They don't want to. I also have mentors, you know. I'm a mentor, but I have mentors. Yeah. I have people that speak into my life. I listen to messages every day. I feed my faith every day. I don't listen to foolishness. The juniors, I don't listen to them. I love them. I'll pray for them. I work with some of them to do certain things, but I don't listen to them. They don't have anything to teach me. They're not where I'm at. You get it? I listen to the giants. I even listen to the ones that are already in heaven that shook the world. Ah. I have an evangelist friend. He, he listens to the people that have the greatest, hugest ministries. He taps into the grace. He's the one I was talking about that got under the hands of his bishop that has tens of thousands of churches 
and the largest church in Africa, which is the largest church building in the world right now. Going to be. Three in Nigeria building arena domes in excess of 100,000 seats inside. 100, 100,000 seats in the building. That's happening nowhere else. Nigerians, see, they got, they got a hold of something. It's the word. They're zealous. They're aggressive. They took, they took it. Did God just come down and said, I love Nigeria? Well, I've been in Nigeria. It's no different than anywhere else. In fact, some of it's really messy, by the way. I don't mind telling you. There's neighborhoods in New York where I'm from that are a mess, so I'm not trying to be bad. I'm not differentiating cultures or ethnicities. There's places in Kenya that are a bloody mess. In fact, almost everywhere. Hello. Most places. You have a property worth billions of dollars. Outside is a trash road full of holes. The people in the government stole the money. They never made the road. This has to stop. Who's going to stop at the church? You know why the church is over there having their rally? We repent for the sins of the nation. They should be standing on the road saying, I command this road to be built. In Jesus, I, I do that. I've done that. You see the roads now. You see the road? The new expressway, the new superhighway, the SGR train that goes across the country. The Chinese built them. Yeah? <clears throat> there was a prophet that spoke it into existence years ago when there was nothing there. You're looking at him right now. And millions of people know me for that. Yes? Speak to it. Talk to it. Corruption, an anti-corruption movement. I thought, why doesn't anybody, why didn't any other prophet speak that? Why was it me? God told me, I'm releasing an anti-corruption movement from heaven on the nation of Kenya. This was uh, uh, back in like 2015, 2016. I did a live broadcast in the streets of, this, of the capital city. And... Uh, then the Lord released another word uh, earlier this year. He said, I'm releasing a new movement in the city of Nairobi, a new movement from heaven, an outpouring of a new move. And he said, any, in the next sentence, he said, and anyone that opposes it will fall down and not get up. He said, this time, they won't be able to stop it. They tried before, but this time. They touch it, they will fall down and not get up. I can take you to people, I don't have time, and it's not even right to say it publicly, Names, places, and faces of dead men, judged people, people that became as nothing because they hated me. Many. Now, I have to explain something a little bit to the younger people or some people just coming on with us lately. And if I talk like that in a, and it seems like a really rough way, you have to understand the history. Don't be quick to go, oh, that's hard. No, understand the whole scenario. A lot of becoming a warrior is also self-defense becoming a ninja. <laughs> it's self-defense. Yeah. And then when God judges someone, it's recompense for the evil they did. If you don't know the, the depths of what happened in the situation, then don't be quick to judge. Look at the result and say, that was beyond what I can understand. Yeah? All right. I got I to gotta get out of here. I got to wrap this. Let's keep praying. Procreative prophetic declaration. Okay, transformations. You didn't remind me. I didn't ask. Tra I'm closing. Transformations. They did a series of, pl of places in the world were transformed. George Otis Jr., his father was George Otis, went to be with the Lord. He picked up the mantle. His father was doing this study of Pentecostal outpouring, stuff like that. George Otis Jr. went around places that were transformed, and every single time it was done by prophetic declaration. There's, a, there's a, a very uh, violent place in Central America somewhere. I don't have time. I don't want to go into all the details. But there's a, a guy, guess what? Funny enough, I met him. I put my arm around him in uh, Dallas, Texas. Oh, my God. I'm, I remember I actually met him. He came to a meeting. Do you know the man is four foot something? And look at me. I'm six foot four. He looked up at me like this. Like he's looking up the, the sequoia trees in California. You know, he, he looked, he stood there, and he, 
when he looked to talk to me, he looked straight up. I was like, oh my God, I felt bad. I almost wanted to kneel down and or lower myself to talk to him. He was four foot something. Small little man in the natural. He shook his region. He cast out the drug cartels who were slaughtering people by the thousands. He turned that hope, and now it became a prosperous country. There were in, people were in poverty. Now the people that got connected with his anointing, like what happens for people that connect with me, there's an anointing of prosperity. He, they all got turned around. Now they're millionaires, they're business people, their crops flourish, everything changed. It happened through one thing and one thing only, prophetic prayer, prophetic declarations, prophesying, declaring over the land the change to come. I speak that over the nation of Kenya. That's the answer for you. That's what you got to do. Speak it into existence. You say, it's just me. I'm just a person. Doesn't matter. Speak. I, I don't know if it'll happen. I don't know how much faith I have. Doesn't matter. Speak it. Keep speaking it. Something wrong in your body. I, I had something. I did a test on something, and, and uh, they told, uh, the, the doctor told me there's something there. I said, I, they said, is there any natural way to get rid of it? No. It's just you have to manage it. I said, I'm not managing nothing. I didn't, I didn't answer him, but I, I speak to it every day. I said, it will disappear. Why? Because I said so. If I leave it there, I leave it there. God leaves it there. You leave it the way it is, and you don't deal with it, it'll stay like that. Are you getting this? The power of dominion living. I got to stop. Father, thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name. The power of dominion living, the importance of it from God's mind. He's telling us, rise up, my people. Rise up, my son. Rise up, my daughter. Get busy. Put things into motion. Put things into action. Stop waiting for anything. There's nothing to wait for. <laughs> There's nothing to wait for. It's time to get busy right now and take dominion. In Jesus' name. Thank you for being my partner. You can tithe, sow, give, offer, However, the links are in the heading of the title. If you need to make Jesus the Lord of your life, please take time to do that. Say, Lord Jesus, I receive you as my Savior. Father God, I thank you for your, the gift of your Son. I receive him as my Savior. I receive eternal life right now. I want to be born again. I want to receive Jesus as my Savior. I say that right now with my mouth. I belong to him now. He's now my Savior. Forgive me of all my sins, Lord. Take me into your family. I come willingly. I accept and receive the gift of eternal life. In Jesus' name, so be it. Amen. Now, share that with others. So I have to get these, uh, I, keep, I keep thinking to do it. I have to get these things in print uh, of, of things written down about how to share the gospel with someone. I'm going to get those and give them to everybody. You can go and lead someone to the Lord, yeah? Let's do that. Let's believe God for a million souls from this ministry. A million, anyway. Let's get a million. I feel convicted about it. Let's get a million. Let's get the membership of the ministry up, 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 up. The Lord wants a lot of people to be connected with us. This is just a, another day, but there's so much God has on his mind. Take it. Take it by force. What you want in your business, Father, I release the power of heaven for success in sales, in clients, in promotions, in the workplace, favor, elevation, higher salaries, promotions, new money that came from you can't even know where. It just comes and shows up. I'm speaking that into existence. Give it to your loyal, faithful <coughs> sons and daughters. From today, new favor comes upon you to rise in the marketplaces, if you or you're in the ministry, your ministry will have open doors and you'll flourish and be blessed. The revelation that God's pouring through me, I give you, let me tell you something, if you wondered, I give you permission to preach everything I've said. I give you the license, I give it, it's copyright, free to copy, copyright, you have the right to copy. I give it, I give it out. I'm not interested in selling works or selling books or whatever. If they sell, if they're printed and published and distributed. People could buy them in a shop. That's how they do business. But all the writings I have, all the revelations, I want to give them out to the millions of people around the world. That's my seed. 
to the body of Christ. And as you sow into this ministry and anointing, you're sowing a pure seed. You're getting blessed from, from, by God himself. But what I have, I freely give because he's given it to me and I'm grateful for it. In Jesus' name, be blessed, be increased, be favored, become more wise, become more powerful, take dominion, receive new strength. Some people have felt, I, I know what this is too, to feel a lack of energy. I release energy, strength of the Holy Ghost, the spirit of might upon you, that you could rise up. You know, since I've made a few other decisions recently, a lot of things are going on, long time, I'm very blessed, you're looking at a very blessed man, and there's a lot about to happen, it's even coming in other stages. It's phenomenal. Those things were in motion anyway. But I, I remember feeling very tired. You know, I don't feel like that. Last many days, I don't feel. I have energy. I don't know where I got it from. It's just, it's, it's supernatural. It's based on decisions. Decisions determine your destiny. Don't think it's just a fleeting miracle or just a, a, a wind of favor maybe came mysteriously that you feel good or you, you get blessed. No, it's because you made a decision. Hello, are you getting that? Make the decision to do all that God wants and he'll, he'll empower you as you walk. In Jesus' name, take dominion, it's time to do it. It's time to take dominion. Uh, the ways to sow are in the heading of the title and you obey God and do what the Holy Spirit tells you to do. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. Do what he leads you to do, in Jesus' name. If you need bank wire details, contact me. I'll give those to you if you have something larger to sow. If you're coming into something, many people, the Lord told me, are going to uh, come into that, and they can't just send it through their card or whatever, just or phone system or whatever. It's something big that they'll have to do a bank to bank. Uh, contact me if you need the details. I'll be glad to talk with you and give those to you. If you want a money gram, Western Union, kind of an antiquated way these days, but you could send cash through those from around the world. Contact me, and I'll give you the where the name and where to send it to. And uh, then you send the control number that we can process that. Um, and if you need whatever details you need to sow seed, you can get from me. But take advantage of the, the PayPal, Cash App in USA. Uh, USA is, Cash App is only in the United States. Uh, PayPal is worldwide. The M-Pesa system for the Kenya to the phone. Amen. Uh, and if you have something special you want to do, you contact me, talk to me. I'm very... Uh, uh, desiring to pray for people individually, all right, and talk to them. So I'm here. You can, you can reach me, all right? The Lord bless you. I'm Thomas Mantha IV. I'll talk to you on the next one. Be blessed, my friend, in Jesus' mighty name. Looking forward to hearing from you.